Welcome to this e-lecture on contracting part one, functions and elements. My name is Finn Winstra, professor in purchasing and supply management at Rotterdam School of Management and holder of the chair endowed by the Dutch Association for Purchasing Management, Navy. This e-lecture was originally developed for the course purchasing and supply management, a core course in the supply chain management master's program at RSM. During the presentation, I will refer to a number of sources. You will find the full references of these sources at the end of the presentation. This e-lecture deals with contracting, one of the main processes within purchasing and supply management. In the PSM wheel, which we often use as a reference framework in structuring our teaching, contracting and implementation is the fifth process within the upper half of the wheel the sourcing part. Contracting follows tendering and supplier selection, which we address in another e-lecture. In his college tour video on contracts and contract management, Van Wele defines three stages related to contracting. The contractual, the pre-contractual and the post-contractual stages. In this slide, you can see how these three stages are related to the process from the PSM wheel. Please note that in his video lecture, Van Wele explicitly uses capital expenditure or project-based acquisitions, such as major engineering and construction projects, as the setting for his review of contracts. But the terminology used here in the PSM wheel can be applied to other purchase situations as well. The pre-contractual stage, according to Van Wele, includes determining the specification of need and the tendering process. The contractual stage, or contract design, includes negotiation and contract signing, and the post-contractual stage, or contract management, includes, according to Van Wele, project execution or delivery, and claims handling. While this seems quite related to what in the PSM wheel is named the implementation part of contracting, I would suggest to relate contract management to the core circle of the wheel, supplier relationship management and performance management. In his video, Van Wele's focus on project procurement leads to an emphasis on the specific form of contract management, which could even be interpreted as purchase to pay, the bottom half of the PSM wheel from the previous slide. In general, however, contract management is seen as a more tactical or strategic activity where the buying firm assesses the compliance of the supplier's performance and behavior with the original contract. While everyone will understand the basic definition of a contract, it may be useful to contrast two common definitions. The first, for instance adopted by ATIA, represents a legal perspective, contracts as mutual agreements enforceable in court. The second alternative definition is a broader one, which sees contracts as obligations to perform, or indeed to not perform, certain actions. Researchers in management may prefer to adopt the latter perspective, because it includes a broader range of written agreements as can be found in the daily practice of buyer-supplier relations. Having defined contracts, the next question is what main varieties in contracts are there? In the second part of this e-lecture, I will go into more detailed varieties, but at the generic level, it may be helpful to think of three main sourcing situations, or governance modes, as it is referred to in economics. First, we may have an in-house supplier. In other words, the buying firm is not contracting with an independent entity, but within the hierarchy of its own organization. Surely, particularly in large corporations, there may be quite formalized relationships between a customer and its internal supplier. And for instance, intensive negotiations on what is referred to as internal transfer prices. 
Still, within purchasing and supply management, we will normally not address such contracts, also because the purchasing department is traditionally not so involved in these internal contracts. At the end of other end of the spectrum, depicted at the bottom of the slide, we have the market, sometimes called the spot market. Here we have highly standardized products or commodities. Think for instance of flowers and vegetables bought at auctions, or grain, metal and oil bought at commodity exchanges. Typically buyers and sellers remain anonymous to each other and use very standardized contracts that usually focus on price. Special derivative contracts may exist, such as futures, to hedge against future risks. This is, for instance, done by airlines that may want to hedge against price fluctuations in fuel prices, or food producers that want to hedge against future shortages in, for instance, the supply of coffee beans or peanuts. In between the market and hierarchy, we have an enormous variety of different types of buyer-supplier relations, which are collectively referred to as bilateral contracting situations. Buyer and supplier are not anonymous anymore and agree on an often customized contract. So here, for instance, a supermarket does not buy its fruits and vegetables via the auction market, but from specific growers using long-term contracts. In this e-lecture, I will not go into great detail regarding the different theories we have in economics and management regarding contracting, but it may be helpful to be aware of some main perspectives. Basically, one can distinguish four main perspectives on the function or role of contracts. These different functions particularly apply to what we defined in the previous slide as bilateral contracting. Transaction cost economics sees contracts mainly as tools to safeguard investments, in particular investments into transaction-specific assets non-redeployable physical and human investments that are specialized. Think, for instance, of a supplier that invested in machines that can only be deployed for one specific buying firm. A second perspective focuses on the role of contracts in governance, allocating decision rights, for instance, on contract renewal, applicable national law, etc., to the respective contracting parties. A third perspective, usually associated with so-called agency theory, sees contracts as devices to align incentives. In this perspective, a critical issue becomes how to create incentives, for instance, by rewarding certain behaviors of suppliers, such as compliance with instructions or rewarding outcomes. A fourth perspective treats contracting as a means of information provision and coordination. This perspective emphasizes, for instance, how contracts can be used to set goals and provide information to suppliers to enable them to perform their activities in the most effective way. These different perspectives may seem abstract at first, but also in practice, buying firms and their managers may have an implicit perspective on contracting as well. And this may also affect what they seek to achieve with contracting and what they will write into a contract. Having defined the main varieties and functions of contracts, we now can review what elements a purchasing contract typically contains. Again, we refer to bilateral contracting situations, not market-based transactions such as for commodities. Obviously, the specific elements may vary depending on the type of product or service being bought and the applicable legislation. One can imagine that the purchase of a highly critical component for medical diagnostic imaging equipment requires a different contract than the purchase of office materials for a university. However, most purchase contracts contain elements as listed in this slide. Please note that INCO terms, which you may have heard about in other courses on supply chain management, refer to delivery terms, typically for physical products. 
in particular regarding the responsibility for transportation, documentation and insurance. For instance, free on board, FOB, one of many alternative INCO terms options, means that the buyer takes delivery of goods being shipped to it by a supplier once the goods leave the supplier's shipping dock. Thus, INCO terms only cover a subset of contract elements. While we have just reviewed the typical elements of a purchasing contract, it is important to point out that these elements may sometimes be allocated to different contract documents. Buying organizations could decide to split their purchasing contract with a supplier into two or three levels of agreements. A purchase order, which is covered by a general framework agreement, which is in turn sometimes preceded by a letter of intent or memorandum of understanding. In the slide, you can see the typical elements of these respective documents, when they are used and what their legal status is. But note that this may vary by country as well. Obviously, there is also the option to apply just one single contract document, which is typically the case for one-off buys, for instance, when giving a project assignment to a management consultant. Finally, by way of conclusion of this first part of the e-lecture on contracting, I want to point out that the importance of contract documents may vary. It varies, first of all, between countries and their respective legal systems. For instance, adaptations of contracts are, according to Dutch law and most legal systems in continental Europe, as binding as the original contract. Parties have the freedom to make adaptations, whether in the text or in appendices or other official documents. Minutes of official partner board or steering committee meetings in which adaptations are agreed are regarded as binding as the original contract. US contract law, on the other hand, is much stricter in the notion that only the official contract is binding, implying that all changes need to be laid down as adaptations of and in the original contract. Secondly, the importance of contract documents may vary between sectors. In some agricultural markets, for instance, a handshake may be as important as a written contract, while highly re regulated sectors such as oil and gas traditionally rely much more on written contracts. Finally, the importance of contracts for a buying firm may vary according to the type of purchase. The higher the value and the supply risk and the less expertise the firm has in buying the product or service, the more it will usually rely on written contracts. This concludes the first part of this e-lecture on contracting in purchasing and supply management. Part 2 of this e-lecture deals with different types of purchasing contracts such as fixed price and time and materials contracts.